Well, it's my turn to take a free kick. Um, the, the Australian government uh, is proposing, and there's bipartisan consensus, that we spend around $50 billion, $50 billion with a B, uh, to buy 12 new submarines to replace the six we haven't used yet. Um, <laughs> And no one is certain who we need them to protect us from. And no one is certain what day we will need them. And no one is certain where we should park them on that day. And no one is certain, if you've followed the Navy, whether we'll have enough crew to staff them. But when it comes to making decisions about national defence, when it comes to making decisions about our health, whenever the consequences are high, whenever the consequences are catastrophic, what sensible people do is take the conservative path. The overwhelming evidence is that we face catastrophic risks from climate change. The overwhelming evidence is from The Economist that the costs of tackling this will actually be very small, especially in economies as rich as our own. So we can bet the House that Lord Monckton is right, or we could insure the House in case he's wrong. Uh, and a final question a final question today is from Mark Kenny. Uh, Mark Kenny from The Advertiser um, Lord Monckton I'll take it from your uh, response to Mr Hart's question that uh, you reject that letter from the House of Lords um, I tell them it's impertinent and they should put my reply on their website they have not so far found the courage to answer all right. Well, can I ask you a question which I, I guess is a first principles question uh, that would have been uh, maybe uh, better asked earlier, but uh, do you, would you like to see companies and individuals put less pollution skyward than is the case now and the, than will be the case with a growing population, or are you unconcerned about it? Right. Let us distinguish between pollution, which usually means particulate pollution, such as soot, or the emission of carbon dioxide, which on any view is not a pollutant. It is plant and tree food. <laughs> if, you were, if we were able to manage a doubling of CO2 concentration this century, which is what I expect to happen regardless of the carbon tax, then what we would find is that at the end of the century, the yield of certain staple crops would rise by up to 40%, and they would be able to survive on less water as well. The greening of the planet in the 30 years since satellites have been watching, as a result of what is known as CO2 fertilisation, is absolutely wonderful. It's actually gone up by 6%. The net primary productivity of plants has risen by 6%. So CO2 if you really are a green and you really want to green the planet, is the way to go. Richard, a quick response, if I may. Um, uh, uh, pollution, is, pollution is a harmful byproduct from a process, and unless, uh, unless we've underestimated the generosity of coal fired power stations for giving us all this free fertiliser for the last hundred years, <laughs> carbon dioxide is literally. A pollutant. It is an unintended and, in a climate constrained environment, harmful byproduct. And economists have said for 200 years, when you want to uh, when you want to solve a pollution problem, the most efficient way to do it is to introduce a price. Now, of course, on the other side of the case, there are people going around giving lectures, telling us, like Private Fraser in Dad's Army, we're all doomed. Well, just look at this one. This is a picture actually produced by a professor of so-called climate change impacts at Imperial College London. Who on earth funded a professorship in climate change impacts, I have no idea. But he thought it would be fun to do a reconstruction of what would have happened if Al Gore's 20-foot 
sea level rise in which this particular professor happens to believe, wrongly, uh, would happen. What, what it would do to the Houses of Parliament. It would drown them, to which I say, and your problem is? <laughs> Most people would be only too happy to see both Houses of Parliament uh, done away with, and if they had a choice, they would actually do away with the Commons and keep the hereditary peers. <laughs> Now, one of the points I want to get across is that we are going to be saying some very obvious things today. I mean, here, look at this. A horse goes into a bar and the barman says, why the long face? Because it's a horse, you idiot. <laughs> and it's going to be obvious points like that that I'm going to be making because those on the other side in this debate like to make the obvious seem absurd and the absurd seem obvious and I'm just going to turn, turn it back the other way. But, do not believe a word I say. Science is not a belief system. Science is not a religion, it's not a superstition, it is a disciplined process of enquiry. And however much you might like my jokes, or my aristocratic demeanour, or my general good nature, or my wit, or my scholarship, all of which are already blindingly evident to you. <laughs> Nevertheless, do not believe a word I say, because you should read and listen to both sides of every scientific question. Do not fall into the trap of being told the science is settled, because it never is. Do not uh, allow yourself to be told the debate is over, it plainly isn't. Just look about you if you want a monument to that. There would not be that many people in this room wanting to hear this whinging palm if in fact the debate was over. The debate is plainly not over. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that in Australia, thanks to you, the debate is now beginning. <laughs> Now, why does the truth matter? That's quite an important philosophical and indeed moral question. And let us look at this portrait by Tintoretto for a moment. There is our blessed Lord standing in front of Pontius Pilate, who asked him, quid est veritas? What is the truth? Now, jesting Pilate, as Bacon records in one of his essays, did not tarry for an answer. He had the Lord of Life in front of him, he could have asked him anything, but he didn't wait for an answer. It was a purely rhetorical question. But in fact, that question, Pilate's question, is the question that underlies every true and honest question. The truth alone is what science as well as religion are directed towards. The truth alone is worthy of our entire devotion. And this was well encapsulated in a remark made by the man credited with being the father of the scientific method. You see him here on this Iraqi banknote, for he was a mathematician and philosopher of science and astronomer in 11th century Iraq. And his name was Abu Ali ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Hussein ibn al-Hussein ibn al-Haytham. And he said this, the seeker after truth does not place his trust in any mere consensus, however broad and however venerable. Instead, he subjects what he has learnt of it to his own hard-won scientific knowledge and to measurement and investigation and scrutiny and checking and checking and checking again. The road to the truth, said Al-Haytham, is long and hard, but that is the road that me, we must follow. And that's the road that we're going to follow today, you and I. And we're going to see why it matters that we should. Particularly when globalised groupthink can lead to the deaths of millions, when the science is ignored, the policies are wrong, and people end up dead. Malaria is a glaring example of this, and one which I receive a lot of vilification from the other side for when I mention it. Because they don't want it to be reminded that it was very much the same environmental movement, such as the Environmental Defence Fund, that argued 40 years ago, and successfully argued, for the banning worldwide of DDT, the only effective agent against the Anopheles mosquito that causes malaria. 
Before the DDT ban, it had been so successful, it had eradicated malaria right across the United States and many other regions of the world, there were only 50,000 deaths a year from malaria. That's still a lot. It would have been nice if they were zero. But look what happened after the DDT ban. A million deaths a year, and those million deaths a year persisted for 40 long years until all of those worldwide responsible for that ban on DDT, that murderous ban that killed 40 million, nearly all of them children, had retired or died. <coughs> Only then did it become possible to uh, get the ban on DDT lifted, and it was lifted on the 15th of September 2006 by Dr. Arata Kochi of the World Health Organization who said this, quite often in this field, science comes second and politics first. We will now take a stand on the science and the data. And he lifted the ban on DDT, a ban which many people on the left in politics, who had originally supported it, now pretend did not even exist. So ashamed, and rightly ashamed are they, at the 40 million deaths that their foolishness caused. How will science recover from all of this? If all of the major national organisations are in it, and they're all wrong, where to next for them? I think the first thing that we have to do is stop funding science as tax taxpayers. That's been a mistake. There is only one paying customer for science these days, and that's the state. 99% of, of all science is bought and paid for by the state via the taxpayer, whether the taxpayer likes it or not. That induces a kind of culture of dependency, much the same as somebody living on the dole. The science, scientists are all like this, and they therefore begin to pander to what the state wants. And indeed, Garth Paltridge, who wanted to speak out recently against global warming, and did so, was rung up by the University's Funding Council of Australia. That may not be its right name, but it's that body. And they rang up and they said, if you say anything like that in public ever again, we will cut off all tenure, all funding, and all grants to you from now and forever. That's the kind of threats that are being made by bureaucrats who want to peddle this agenda because they can see it's going to make them very rich. So we've got to get science out of the hands of bureaucrats, out of the hands of the state, and back into the hands of aristocrats who do it on their own because they're... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Lord Monkton, um, just to uh, query a bit further on your closing remarks there, uh, regarding all the poor countries and uh, our friends up there on the screen, uh, it's well said that you never see a rich man go hungry. And uh, that's very true. I mean, the people who need the food can't afford to buy it. Uh, those in Australia and other countries, we can't afford to grow it and give it away. Somewhere there needs to be a balance. Where do you draw a solution to your problems where we can get rid of the food we can grow? Yep and get it to those who need it and we all survive. Well, I'll tell you the first thing that I would do, and that is to abolish the European Union. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. That's not, uh, that's not a, a silly point, actually, because the European Union abandoned Commonwealth preference. And once we no longer preserved Commonwealth preference, other Commonwealth countries didn't either. One of the greatest mechanisms the world has ever seen for getting food from countries like Australia that grow it in huge quantities to countries in the Commonwealth, the Black Commonwealth in particular, where food was desperately needed, was Commonwealth preference. It is a bitter regret to me that the European European Union interfered with that process and, and Edward Heath's stupidity in not preserving Commonwealth preference. So, like Her Majesty the Queen, I see a terrific role for the Commonwealth and in particular for great and splendid nations like Australia. I now have to dash for my plane, but I do want to leave you with one final thought. It has been a serious and real pleasure for me to be in your great and great-hearted and splendid country. So I end just with three words. God bless Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Discussion. Debate. Democracy. This is APEC, Australia's public affairs channel.